Hey Fizz One Kids, Campbell here. In our video today, we're going to talk about projectile motion. Now, what is projectile motion? Well, it's when an object is launched into the air and just subjected to gravity. And now you're thinking, well, how is that different from free fall, Mrs. Gamble? Well, really, the only difference is that I'm launching it at some angle to the horizontal. So instead of just being vertical motion like free fall, I now am moving in two dimensions. So let's talk about the principles of projectile motion. The first thing is that the path is parabolic. Whether I launch an object horizontally or here, our football kicker, um, the path is parabolic and the velocity vector, the net vector, is going to be tangent to the path. So you'll see here these little velocity vectors. Notice that they're tangent to the path. That's the net velocity. Now, what's happening in the x and y direction are actually completely different, and we're going to see that in class. We're going to compare an object launched to an object dropped. And what you will see is the one that's dropped reaches the ground at the same time as an object launched horizontally. And that's because if an object is launched horizontally, right, all of its velocity, initial velocity, is in the x direction. There is zero velocity in the y direction initially, just like something that's been dropped. So the velocity, it's going to gain y velocity at the same rate as something dropped because in the y direction, both of those motions are being controlled by the acceleration due to gravity. Now, in the absence of area resistance, our horizontal velocity is never going to change because in the absence of air resistance, there's going to be zero acceleration in the x direction. So my initial velocity um, in the x direction is going to stay constant as I travel down. So my final velocity in the x direction is the same as my initial velocity. But in the vertical direction, because I'm under the influence of the acceleration due to gravity, my velocity in the y direction is going to change. And for an object that I launch horizontally, it's going to increase as it falls. Now, the resultant velocity, that velocity that I drew tangent to the path on this diagram, right, that's going to be the vector sum of that x velocity that doesn't change and that y velocity, which is increasing as it falls. For an object that's thrown at some angle, I have some other little rules that we should remember. Remember that still the velocity in the x is going to be constant. You'll notice that its vector right, is the same in magnitude all the way around and the velocity in the y direction is going to change. So it starts off at some maximum magnitude here and it decreases till it gets to maximum height. And then when I get to the maximum height, my velocity in the y is zero. But that doesn't mean the velocity of the object is zero, right? If it was, then it drop out of the sky. The velocity in the x at maximum height is that velocity initial that you had in the x. Now, just like with free fall, when I get back to the same height I was traveling, the velocity is going to be equal but opposite in sign. So when I reach the ground here at the same height that I started at, then my velocity here are going to be the same. And in order to do these problems, we have to use those equations of kinematics that we, want, we learned about in our last unit. But we're going to have to separate this initial velocity that I've been given at some angle into x and y components. So I'm going to have to do some sines and cosines of that velocity vector to break it into the x and the y components because what's going on in the y is totally different from what's going on in the x. So when you're given an initial velocity, the first thing you're going to do is do sines and cosines. So the x, you're always given the velocity to the horizontal, so you're going to take a cosine of that velocity um, to find out what the velocity in the x is, the initial velocity in the x, and you're gonna do the same thing 
um, with the sign to find the velocity in the y. So once you've found that, once you've done that, you will never ever use this velocity again. Boom, done. What goes on the x is separate from what go goes on in the y. The velocity is constant the whole time in the x direction. The acceleration is zero. And in the y direction, it's just like free fall. Right? As I go up, I slow down, I reach maximum height where velocity is zero, and I come down and I speed up. Remember, the whole time, the acceleration in the y direction is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. It's not zero at the maximum height. It doesn't change, but that's only for the y. The x is zero. So when we use our equations, these are the kinematic equations we learned in our last unit, but we have to split them because what's going on in the x is totally different from what's going on in the y. In the x direction, remember, acceleration is zero. So if I go to any of these equations up here, right, that term drops out, that term drops out, initial velocity equals my final velocity or the velocity at any point. The only equation that works, right, is this one. You get rid of that acceleration term, acceleration is zero, right? And that's really just this, velocity is the change in x over the change in time because there's no acceleration. If I were to graph them and I start some height above the ground, right, this would be my x, right? I'm gaining x position at a constant rate. Notice my slope is constant because my velocity is constant. In the absence of air resistance, velocity in the x is constant. In the y direction, right, I have acceleration due to gravity, so it's just like doing a free fall problem, right? I got all of the equations and the graphs of the motion, right, the y, if I throw something up and it comes down, I kick something at an angle upwards and it comes down, right? These look just like, just like, oops, like I can spell free fall. Same exact graphs because what's going on in the y direction is totally controlled by the acceleration due to gravity. Now, launch angle is critical, and we're going to do a rocket lab, and you're going to look at launch angle. When an object is launched at an angle, there is a compromise between how far it goes and how high it goes. Right? The launch angle will determine the range. And so the more velocity it has in the x direction, so the lower the angle, the greater the range could be. But if it's too close to the ground, right, it's not going to be in the air very long. So if we launched an object here at 15 degrees, it doesn't go very far. I launch it at 30 degrees, it gets farther. But notice that at 45 degrees, I have the greatest range. So 45 is a great compromise between time in the air and velocity in the x. That range, range is x distance. Maximum height right, is also dictated by that launch angle. And of course, the more I launch it vertically, right, the higher that vertical angle is, the, is the higher I'm going to get. Now, I want you to notice some complementary paths. Um, see how 15 and 75 end up at the same place? And how 30 degrees ends up at the same place as 60 degrees? So here's 30 degrees and 60 degrees. Well, those are complementary angles. Is that the math term for it? Well, anyways, from a sine and cosine standpoint, when we break stuff into components, all right, one's going to go higher than the other. But when we go and do the math, we'll see that they end up in the same place. Totally, totally cool. Notice the ones that spend the most time in the air are the ones that are launched most vertical. So you'll see that our 90 degrees has the greatest time in the air because that's where my blue times are. And the 75 is next, and then we start getting lesser and lesser times when the angle gets less. Now, oops, let me get rid of that. For smaller objects, air resistance is critical. And so the maximum range will actually come at less angles than 45 because it's not, when you launch at a lower angle than 45, there's not as much um, vertical velocity to get pushed back. Um, so you'll see that actually when we do the rocket lab because unfortunately, 
I cannot get rid of air resistance when we're outside. In fact, if there's wind, then that's going to even be a bigger problem. All right, we're going to do one example together in this video, and then we're going to do another one in class. Here's a horizontal launch problem. A motorcycle speeds horizontally off a cliff that's 50 meters high. At what speed must the motorcycle leave the top of the cliff so that it lands on the ground at 90 meters from the base of the cliff? Now, I know you're thinking, oh, I could just maybe do set up a right triangle, and no, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. You need to set up x equations and y equations. So now we're going to have two columns of data. In the x direction, we're trying to find this. This is our unknown. That's our question mark. The acceleration, remember, is zero. We're starting at an initial position of zero. We're going to call that zero. And our final position here in the x direction is 90 meters. But in order to figure that out, right, because remember in the x, velocity in the x is a constant because there's no acceleration. And so it'd be like, oh, this is easy. I just go 90 divided by time. Oh, crap. I don't know the time. Well, how do I find the time? Oh, I could find the time in the y direction. So I have to look at what's going on in the y direction. So remember, if I leave completely horizontal, there's no velocity in the y initially. So my initial velocity in the y is zero. The acceleration is acceleration due to gravity, negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, if we call this zero, our y position here is zero, then this has to be negative 50. Of course, I would probably do it the other way. I would call the ground zero and where I started positive 50 because I'm not good with the whole negative thing. All right, so we got to find time because if we look at the kinematic equations for the x direction, right, you have this velocity is the change in position over change in time and you don't know time. So if we go to the y direction, we want one that solves for time. But if you look at your equations, there's two of them. Right, there's my favorite equation, but I don't know the speed when it hits the ground, and it's not zero, because boom, you hit the ground. You quickly stop, but it's not zero when you hit the ground. So that means my first equation's out. Oh, sad face, sad face. So now I have my second equation, right? The, that second equation, my least favorite equation, um, which is y final is equal to y initial plus the initial velocity times time plus one half acceleration times squared. Ugh. Oh, wait, the initial velocity in the y is zero. So I can just get rid of this term. Bye bye. And then the initial position, if I call it zero or the final position zero, whichever, it's going to end up with a negative 50 anyways. Both those go away. So if I rearrange to solve for t, right, I would move the 2 over to the side, so times 2 divided by g, and then take the square root, I would get this equation. So now all I have to do is multiply 2 times negative 50, divide by negative 9.8, and then take the square root, and I get 3.2 seconds. So now I know the time, so I can just plug it into that easy equation, right, to solve for vx. Oops, I'm in the way here. So position over time, because there's zero acceleration in the x direction, I take that 90 meters, I divide by 3.2 seconds, and I get 28 meters per second. Holy cow, that's fast. That's one scary fast biker. Is he evil Knievel? All right, we're going to do another one of these problems in class where we launch it at an angle. We'll see how we do that, because that's a little more complicated. So I'll see you in class. Answer your WSQ questions.